Hi, everybody. This is Nate Norfolk. I'm the Wine and Spirits Director here at Ray's. I'm also a certified sommelier. Um, we're going to get this going. I'll wait one more minute and just do the intro again. Um, should be a fun, should be a fun one. Um, hoping everybody can hear everything well out there. Um, and this is the order we're going to, we're going to taste the wines in. So from left to right is the, uh, Villagiata Suri Barbera. We'll do that first. The Luigi Anaudi Doliani, which is a dolcetto. And then the Angelo Negro um, Lange Nebbiolo. And if possible, um, have every, everything out and uh, pour, you know, all three glasses. Because I really want to stress um, we can we're going to really look at the color of these wines a bit and examine some of the differences. Uh, there's especially between, uh, Nebbiolo has a very unique characteristic. Once we get to that wine, it has a definitely, um, a different, uh, a, a, it throws a different hue even when it's young compared to a lot of other red wines. And it's something that really stands out in blind tastings and, um, uh, help is very helpful uh when you if you do find yourself in a situation where you're blind tasting wine nebbiolo is somewhat easy to identify um in blind tastings so let's get her started here um i do wanna i do want to let everyone know um oh man hey bob campbell hey bob oh very nice okay um an old associate whose son worked here at one point and who's going to be, a, his son's going to be a lawyer pretty soon. Hi, Bob. Um, I won't get too sidetracked. Uh, so we've got the three wines in front of us. Hopefully you haven't poured out. We, um, and I want to, let me review how you can buy everything. So on the, on Ray's website, I've got all the wines discounted. I ask that they're going to, they're under like a, like a pre-sell. They're, they're going to be like a pre, they're going to be tagged as pre-arrival. I'll have everything ready to pick up by noon on, on Wednesday. This way I can fulfill everyone's order. Even if someone has a larger order and wants a full case, sorry if it, it always takes a couple of days, but this way I have, it's, there's a lot less snafus if we, if you give me three business days to put this together or two business days. So, um, I'll have everything ready on Wednesday. I put a sale on all the wines. Um, so these are pretty, pretty great prices across the board. And like, these are really value oriented wines for Piedmont, which is really, you know, thought of as the, um, probably the epicenter of quality red wine in Italy. I think the focus is starting to be on, on Tuscany. But I would argue that, that Piedmont offers more uh, variety than, than Tuscany, especially when we talk about uh, indigenous grape varieties, uh, types of wine that are kind of exclusively grown there. Um, these three wines that we're going to try tonight, I, I think, are really are inimitable. I mean, no place else in the world really produces Barbera, Dolcetto or uh, Nebbiolo in the same manner that uh, Piedmont does, where these wines are, are indigenous and have really been cultivated in one way or another since the all three of them since probably the Middle Ages. Um, all right, so we got the that's how you order stuff. The Barbera, the first wines on sale, it's twelve ninety eight. The Doliani, which is a all Dolcetto based wine, is going to be fourteen dollars and ninety eight cents. Um, and the uh, Angelo Negro Angeline Nebbiolo is $17.98, which is just a killer, killer price for Nebbiolo-based wines. Um, so folks that are new out there, once again, I'm Nate Norfolk. I'm the Wine and Spirits Director here at Ray's Wine and Spirits. If you have, feel free to um, type into the live chat. I'll answer questions as we go along. And then at the very end, which will probably be 
around 6.30, I'll do a, um, a question and answer um, segment too. I do ask, um, yeah, that, that, you know, like try to stay on topic. <laughs> I understand how these things can deviate, you know, if, if we want to discuss food pairings or the ageability of the wines. And I, if I don't address that, feel free to reach out about that in the chat. Um, it's it, these are these are the standard topics of conversation. Um, I'll I'll we'll get a little bit into the history of each thing, but I'm going to stick kind of mean more towards the kind of features and benefits of each wine and some of the differences between them. Um I'll also plug, um, we, in two weeks from today, on the 24th of April, I'm going to be doing a class with uh, uh, Teresa Heredia, who is the winemaker at Gary Farrell Winery in uh, the Russian River Valley of Sonoma, and we are going to taste the uh, current release uh, Russian River Valley uh, Selection Chardonnay, from Gary Farrell and the current release, Russian River Valley uh, Pinot Noir from Gary Farrell. Teresa's going to walk us through how she makes the assemblage for those for both of those wines, how she picks different vineyard sites that they um, buy grapes from and um, blends them together. Uh, 2018 is a, a just an epically great vintage for Sonoma Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, I think the Gary Farrell wines are just, you know, among some of the greatest Chardonnay and Pinot Noir out there in the sub fifty dollar price point from from Sonoma currently, um, and they're they're really really beautiful, and we're lucky to have her be live with us two weeks from now. Um, but let's let's drink these wines from Piedmont, okay? So I mean, like I know everybody. If you're new here, usually we get going and. There's some jokes are going to be had in the whole nine yards. Somebody's probably going to say, I'll probably say something I regret at some point. I'm, I'm pretty sober nowadays, though. And I mean that in the, like, in the, in the relative term, you know, um, when we do these things live, I'm usually the most sober person in the room. So everybody should just drink the Barbera because, like, we're Wisconsinites and we got to, you know, wet the whistle. And I don't need, like, you know, half hour presentation before we can have all the drinks. So, like, just... Sup it up. <laughs> hey, Jeff, man, if it, we, we can, Jeff Kaki, brother, man, we can always, if you want to hit me up about politics <laughs> on social media, uh, you, you, you can slip into my DMs, baby boy. <laughs> man, I would say before we even get going, like this Barbera is probably the wine. I've drank the most in the last, in the last year at home. It's, um, I have this with like, like this is kind of my go-to red wine and I'll sometimes, um, have it with a little bit of a chill on it. So, um, we didn't set a bet for the time of the first F-bomb. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> hey man. <laughs> No, I, I, hopefully I won't. I won't get too out of control. So if we look at the PowerPoint, we're going to you'll notice that, you know, here's an outline of, of here's a geopolitical map of the current Italian Republic. Um, and Piedmont is located in the uh, extreme kind of northwest of Italy. And it's, it's actually it's landlocked. Um, I want and and. You know, at, for the, the vocab-minded folks out there, Piedmont, literally like Pied Foot Mount, Mountains, Foot of the Mountains, the whole area is really surrounded. I'll bounce between here, and uh, it's the Apennines and the Alps really dominate how Piedmont. I mean, here we go. Here's a topographical map. Um, you know, or here's a satellite image of it. And we really look, we really get, we're really like, surrounded by mountains in this kind of in this like on three sides and this really dominates the the climate and the um the, why it's such a beautiful wine region actually um so 
you know, extreme northwestern part of Italy. I'd also say we, we can't take for granted the idea that, that Piedmont is really one of the, was really, um, really tantamount and super important in the Risorgimento, the, the actual founding of the Republic of Italy. And, um, but also due to its border to France and once being part of Savoy in France, there's, there's a French influence. Um, there's a French influence in the language. Um, also we're just, you know, uh, Switzerland is just to the North too. Um, it's really a cultural crossroads for Italy in a lot of ways. And we think of Piedmont as being much more, a much more affluent uh, and having a little more cultural capital than places, you know, in southern Italy, like Campania, Calabria, Puglia, these parts down here. Really, Piedmont has a lot more ching-ching to it. And I'd, I'd say because of that, as we progress, you know, and, and you know, Italy's in it, is thousands of years of wine culture, Piet, wines from Piedmont demand more money um, and are, are, are of a higher value than wines from other areas of Italy. And I think that has to do more, probably more with the historic significance of their wine and, and like for centuries now, having somewhat of an export market for their wines um, and just being valued more historically on the international market. That's changing with a lot of places in Italy, also regions in Italy, finding to uh, uh, being more focused on fine wine, where Piedmont has historically really been the epicenter of, of fine wine uh, production in Italy. All right. Uh, driving in that area can be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I, I've, I've visited Piedmont um, twice uh, in, it's been a while, in 2010 and in 2012. And, uh, you know, I unfortunately did have, got to, that got the experience to drive around there. And it was, um, it was incredibly confusing. I, I agree with that. And there, there definitely weren't, uh, in rural areas, there aren't a, exactly a lot of English speakers that can help you find your way around. And roads tend to not be marked for a while sometimes. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah, this is... So, th Barbera is really one of the classic... Barbera, to me, is is one of the ultimate red wines for food. And it's one of the ultimate value red wines for food. So, I, I kind of... I leaned into this a little bit. And we can sip on this Barbera, man. This is the thing I poured myself the most of, actually. Hmm. We're talking about the mountains... You know, this really abuts the Alps all here. And what we have is the longest, the the Po River, uh, which is the longest river in Italy, really bisects the southern part of Piedmont. And the Po River is an incredibly fertile plain. And most of this valley actually is, is, is dedicated more um, for agricultural production and not viticulture, where once we get into winemaking, we're kind of north here in areas that we would call the the uh, Asti and the Lange, which are in the states of Cugno or um, uh, the, con oh boy, the geopolitical breakdown of Italy. This is a region, um, oh boy, and then there's like 106 smaller areas within Italy that are smaller than the regions. And they're kind of they kind of operate as almost like a county level. And Cugno is one of them. Lange and Asti are within that. And there, I'll get to a I'll get to a more detailed map of of how those wine regions are broken down. Um, importantly, um, you know, really where we're de what we're dealing with this is an incredible hilly area that leads up to the Alps. And because of that, there's a variety of different exposures. So the a lot of the best grapes are planted on south-facing hills, both in Asti and the Lange. And we really get Nebbiolo, which we'll get to is um, in, in the areas of Barolo and Barbaresco, are almost exclusively done on those um, south-facing hills because they, ripe, they um, grapes tend to ripen better there. That's really the main, main reason there's a breakdown between what we would call like kind of limestone dominant soils um, and then sandier soils. And 
without getting too deep into that, a lot of the uh, calcareous soils are uh, dedicated in Barolo and Barbaresco, and they tend to make really like rich, heavy, heady, deep wines with like this great acidity. And then wines kind of north of there in the Roero, which tends to have more of sandy soils, we get wines that are a little more fruit driven and lighter in color. Um, and I'll break those down as we get into this, man. Um, this is just this, you know, gorgeous kind of Roman age, um, you know, buildings in Turin. Um, and this is interesting, you know, there's, 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 uh, Piedmont has its own, um, dialect of Italian and this is really, Turin really is a crossroads, um, and uh, the idea, I always talk about this when we talk about like, like, like if you visit Italy and you go to like Florence or something, like, like in Tuscan, if you go to Tuscany, the folks in Tuscany are really not going to have any interest in talking about wines from Piedmont, nor is the average Joe Schmo just on the street or, you know, I guess he'd be a Giuseppe Schmeppi. <laughs> <laughs> would have, you know, like, like a, a working knowledge of the wines from a, a region, you know, only a hundred kilometers or so away. It's just, these are distinct, different cultures. And Italy wasn't really its own nation state as we think about it until the late 19th century. Nonetheless, most of these, most of the wine regions have hundreds if not thousands of years of, of, of history and have been and are very, very proud of that. And this is one of the reasons why, especially in the Europe, throughout the European Union, we see wines named after the region they come from um, and this, typically of the region they come from and not necessarily from the grape variety they made. This, these wines we're having today are a little bit of an exception to that. Uh, Turin is underrated. It's a beautiful city and easy to get around. Yeah, Tur Turin is really very, very beautiful city. Yeah, um, man, I really would love to lead a tour, especially Piedmont. Yeah, and T Turin's roughly a million people. Um, da -da 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 -da, beautiful selections. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much. Thomas Jefferson did love Piedmont. <laughs> um Am I answering everybody's questions? Okay. Yeah, I'll get more into the Barbera thing. Okay, so now we're gonna gonna get into a little more detail of a map here. And um, as I kind of get down onto the wines, we're gonna look. Um, I broke this down. You know, Turin is in in kind of the north of the Po River here, and but the main uh, wine regions here are the larger area. Here is a Cunio, and within it we have the Lange, which is this area that's um, demarcated with the dashes. And within the Lange, we've got Barolo, Barbaresco, Elba, and the Roera. I'll, I'll touch on that next. But really where this, this first wine we come from, this is Barbera de Asti from a producer called Villagiata. And, um, you know, something that's commonly confusing for, for a lot of consumers is, we in the United States, um, in uh, po post World War II United States, the most popular one of the most popular wines from from Italy was um, what what until two thousand eight was referred to as Asti Spumante, the sparkling sweet Muscat based wine from from Asti, um, and thus Asti became synonymous with that type of wine. But the region also makes uh, Barber wines from Barbera, uh, Dolcetto, and a host of other red and, and white grape varieties, including this um, just really delicious, uh, you know, Barbera de Asi is incredibly, incredibly value oriented and of relatively high quality. And actually it's the largest uh, production red wine in Piedmont. Everybody's having this. You know, um, Stephanie remark Stephanie is doing this remarks that, you know, this is really good with cured meat. Like 
the, Barbera is a really cl- one of the, a classic red wine for um, pairing with uh, with cured meats, and I think for a variety of reasons, it's really it's relatively low in tannin but high in acidity, um, and the acidity really works with like fat and salt well. Whereas like tannic wines tend to really get when we pair them with like salty things. It can really accentuate the the tannin a little bit, and Barbera, if you'll notice, is like has a really silky, silky um, texture to it. And if we look at this wine, we see that it's it's got some transparency to it. It's like I'd call it translucent. Like it's not super super dark. It's a classic like ruby color to it, and. Um, um has just really really kind of kind of cherry like slightly dark fruit character to it at the same time i get a little like like kind of a time slash um like thyme and rosemary thing to it like a dried herb character when i when i smell the wine um And this is really clean for for Barbera, um, and I don't mean that like like some sometimes Barbera can be very a really savory wine and have more like leather and like slightly mushroomy characters and and like kind of drift towards like a balsamic aspect to it too. And I get sometimes I even get like. Um, like kind of root and soil soil aromatics to it there's no there this is this has no oak aging to it though um sometimes it's it's more and more typical for um it's not odd nowadays for some producers to use uh especially french oak nowadays or slavonian oak on um um for the aging of barbera based wines which tends to kind of actually give them a, a deeper richer more concentrated character i think if there's any complaint about barbera is that it will um it, it's sometimes on the it can be sometimes on the lighter side of things um and people will argue back and forth about the ageability of barbera um i i think these wines are are relatively age worthy and i think you're just standard barbera bottling it's like not weird for it to be like three to five years it's going to be gorgeous some things that are barrel aged and of a really exceptional quality are, are in you know you you can hang on to for 10 years or so i tend not to think of it as a wine that's going to like become exponentially greater over time i think that it's the beauty of it is that it's um it's it's freshness and its ability to pair with like high acid foods um and like like interestingly like we when we think about piedmont um um, you know, when we think about Piedmont, we, the foods of Piedmont are really like, they're less tomato based as like Southern Italian cuisine is. And in Piedmont, we have, um, really, you know, rich egg pastas. Um, of course, um, oh my God, risotto, uh, truffles, bra, Tome, um, you know, washed rind cheeses, uh, really, you know, strongly flavored, both um, sheep and cow's milk cheeses, too. And these are, this is a beautiful wine with all, all of the above, but still, like, in, in, like, a basic day, like, I'll make, you know, 
spaghetti with marinara for my kids and have a glass of this at the same time. It's a great pizza wine too. Barbera is really, really, really versatile with food because it does have this great acidity and this low tannin. You can pair it with almost anything. I don't think it's weird to chill this to about like 55 degrees, like 20 minutes in the fridge just, just crushes it. You know, um, oh, wow, <laughs> animal. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of questions about, like, um, just kind of, kind of, like, how this tastes, right? Um, um, okay, so the question is a bit of, a bit of animal. Yeah, I, I tend to, to think about, this is a very cleanly made, made Barbera, though, but, like, Barbera tends to have, and a lot of Piedmontese wines have just, just in general have, slightly earthy qualities to them. I would say, let's think about the reason that a wine tastes has an earthy character to it. Let's think about it as a deductive reason as opposed to an inductive reason. Like, meaning like, let's think about what somebody didn't do to it. And um, a couple things can lead to kind of earthy flavors, like natural yeasts. Like, Probably any of you that have traveled to any wine region sometimes will notice, oh my gosh, like when I taste this wine, it smells like the place. Well, I mean, that's got, um, there's a myriad of reasons why that can happen. Um, I think most folks would, would come to an assessment that a lot of what you're probably smelling are, is yeast and that, that indigenous yeasts in an area or native yeast um, really have a, an exponential amount of aromatic qualities, and that can lead to earthy flavors and earthy aromas in wines. I would also say the absence, the ab, the absence of new oak in wines tends to let the more savory characteristics of of a grape become m more. Um, aromatically present in a wine. I hope that's a good way of answering that. So we'll find like this is this wine has zero contact with oak at all. Um, and it's interesting that we say it's more like a you know we more like a sweet earthiness because I I kind of get like a leather thing. I get a little balsamic on this too as we were bringing up too. And it's not like a like a funky dirty earthy flavor. It's more like kind of like like after after a rainstorm kind of kind of earthy flavor. Um, and Chris says he's drinking it with some Pecorino Romano. Yeah, not the same region, but it it probably works really really well. Yeah, um, hopefully that answered the earthy earthy thing. Mm. So good, man. This is like my cold pizza wine too. Like sometimes this is my like. I've really drank a ton of this and it's, it's the thing like, like, it's like my midnight, I, 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 I'd be lying. This is like a midnight munchy wine to me too. Cause usually this will hang out. You can have it open for two or three days. No, no problem. Barbera's kind of got the acidity to keep it up. Um, and it's weird when also when I say leather, like it doesn't, it's not like a new leather. It's got like kind of an old leather vibe to it too. Right. Um, I think I, I, yeah, and let's talk about this too. You know, like like Barbera's Barbera can can be pretty alcoholic, and like you, you talk to just about anybody in Piedmont, especially older people. Like whenever I listen to podcasts with winemakers, you know, there's always some some like like um, like Aldo Catarno or oh my god, I, I it was a really old guy that was on the I'll drink to that podcast. I don't want to get too deep into it, but. You know, he's like, have a, it's my, it's my 52nd harvest in the Piedmont. And I tell you, the last 12 years, never has it been so warm. You know, um, like, like a lot of folks in Piedmont say that, that like, like it is getting warmer there. And like a, a hard thing now is for people to keep the alcohol levels in check with some of the wines. Because as much as we're like, cool, dude, the wine is so, like, just totally boozy, there's an aspect when these wines get 
too strong, from being too ripe, that they are somewhat obtrusive. And they don't work as well with food. They become kind of rich and blousy and fat. Barbera rarely has that problem. You do see Barbera grown in California, and some of it can be really, really have some have some boozy characteristics to it. But it's really its beauty is that it's this low tannin, high high acid wine. Yep, here this is I took this from the Wine Folly website, which is pretty great if you're just looking for. Um, um, you know, if you're just looking for like basic, great information about, uh, basic and concise information about styles of wine, Wine Folly is a really, really great website. So, and they do these kind of flavor breakdowns of some grape varieties. So we talk about, you know, like, like Barbera is totally, totally dry. It's more medium to full bodied. I, I agree with that, but it's got super low tannin. And it's got really, really high acid. So it's got that zesty, super fresh, too. Um, yep, Bradley, yeah, the Petrichor thing is like, um, it's funny. Uh, yeah, Petrichor is something my, my wife and I talk about that as, a, as an aroma all the time. Uh, man, any thoughts or questions about this? I, I'll get a little bit into... Um, uh, Kind of, kind of more details about this. Do, 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 do. I already talked about the calcareous soils. We have this also lends to it. You know, calcareous, calcareous um, soils are usually based from ancient maritime deposits, like tiny, tiny fossils of, you know, from a place that used to be a seabed and now it's raised up. And it got, has a limestone character, which confusingly is like the soil itself is is very base and tends to tends to yield wines that have high acid, um, which is very very true of true of Asti. Um, this is great. This is this is the town. This is the town of Asti here. Woo woo man, damn. Man, Italy, really, man, God, it's gorgeous. <laughs> man, it is, they're a good-looking country. They, they, got, they got that thing down, man. Um, it's just so bucolic. <laughs> All right. Um... Oh man, no, you, uh, I mean, we can joke around about the, the, the dirty talk. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've got the Julia Child uh, accent in, in, in me tonight or not yet, guys. Um, uh, the list of all the stuff you are supposed to smell in the wine. What is the best way to smell all the stuff in the wine? is that your nose has been smell trained to particular herbs. Whoa, Dennis. Wow, this is a whole other dude. When we go when we go back to live stuff, like here I'll go back to that cuz cuz we'll just touch base on this. So, let let's just think about this, you know? And and I, I kind of like the the list of like things that you can, you know, these are primary flavors and they're really just a launching pad. Um so to answer your question, Dennis, you know, back when we did these things live, which I think is, you know, it's only a few months away from getting back to that, God knows when. But um, I'll usually do a couple, like annually, one or two, one or two classes that are all about how uh, um, sommelier, a sommelier will uh, taste wine and how we assess the aromatic qualities of wines. So, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, just building up uh, um, a sense memory. Like, like some people just naturally have a, a, an, a, an ability to remember the way things smell. Um, I by no means think that anyone, what one's um, ability to appreciate wine is diminished because they can't identify this like laundry list of of objective fruit flavors in something. I, I just think it's it's kind of 
it, it, it's 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 silly. You know what I mean? It's like it's like you don't have to have a you know you don't have to have the more more cones in your eyes to uh, or name you know ten thousand different colors to appreciate a painting by Van Gogh. I do think having some ideas that are primary flavors or aromatic qualities of a wine really do allow people to delineate a different types of wine. Um, and I usually find that kind of like the generic fruit descriptors are the last thing that helped me differentiate wines. Um, like Barbera, I think would be really hard for me to pick out specifically in a blind tasting. I think what would give it away to me more than anything I smell is the idea that it's a low tan, the wine is low in tannin and high in acid. Um, but, but great question. And I hope that that answers that for you. I do think though that like, like the more you look for it, you know, an individual scents and aromas, the more you start to remember them. And, you know, when I was a, when I was a younger man, um, I definitely found myself once I got into wine and talked about it and wrote about wine a lot, I then did start intentionally smelling things. And like, you know, we brought up the petrichor smell, the smell of, you know, fresh, fresh rain. Um, that was something that I then began to remember and associate with certain wines. Um, and also herbs, I would really, I would really focus on them individually. And, uh, for that reason, um, I think I do get, I get a lot of pleasure out of wines because I, I am really interested in individual smells, but it, it is a matter of training, I think, but you know, some people just have a knack for it, but by no means, by no means do I think that not being able to, you know, objectively identify certain flavors or aromatic qualities of wine, does it, does it make, give people, someone a greater, you know, um, appreciation? Um, sorry, down the rabbit hole. Um, we should storm the second floor and take over the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need scent bulbs at tastings. There's a kit called a Nas Divan. Divan. And um, it has a bunch of different smells to it. And it's like a kit you can buy, and it has about 100 of them. Um, yeah, okay. Um, perfect. So we talked about Berbera. I kind of hit that. Right, we look, We talked about the differentiation between these areas. Um, this is the producer, Villagiada. Um, the actual winemaker, his name is Andrea Faccio. He makes... Um, a host of other wines. He actually makes like four or five different Barberas. This is, uh, this specific wine is known as Suri, which Suri, S-U-R-I, or Sori, S-O-R-I, are, mean hillside in the Piedmontese dialect, right? So, um, yeah, it, it literally is just, just denoting the fact that he harvests the grapes from, uh, these, uh, for these wines from, from from hillsides and it, the connotation is the sunny side of the hill as the notes say so these are typically south uh southwest south and southwest facing hillsides um which get which get the best sun exposure in the northern hemisphere um as i mentioned there's no um there's no barrel aging of these wines so they're so it is really really fresh um it's not, there's no crazy, you know, winemaking tricks or the, to this. This is his largest production wine. Um, and, you know, really his kind of entry level Barbera. He does a couple things that are, are barrel aged, but currently aren't carried in, in Wisconsin. Mm. Uh, We need scent bulbs. Maybe it's their safe word. Man, dude, you guys are raw, man. Um, man, you don't even you don't even know, dog. <laughs> no, my uh, my wife's an attorney, so so you know, like like, dude, man, you know, like we argue behind closed doors at this point. Um, all right. Um, and maybe that's part of the spice, my guy, you know, um, 
All right, so we did the Barbera thing. Any questions about the Barbera before I move on? I'm going to give it just a minute here. I think I, I kind of touched base. You know, the grape variety Barbera has grown, grown in other places throughout the world, but once again, we're dealing with grape varieties and wines that are really indigenous to Piedmont and, and almost exclusively made here. Um, Mm -hmm. And it would suck to lose your sense of smell as a psalm. <laughs> it would be really, really weird. Not to, I, I have a friend who actually is is a psalm and, and and got COVID and and she um yeah she she lost her sense of smell for about a month plus she was kind of worried. Um, she is all good to go though, man. And totally, totally up and up and has moved on. Um, all right. No questions. Okay. All right. All right. So now we're, we're moving on to the, um, Luigi Enaudi Doliane. And we're going to notice here, um, this area is called Doliani. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit to the map, and then I'll bump back here. So when we look at, at like this, you know, this this the larger Piedmont area. This is the area called within Piedmont. There's just there's forty plus wine regions here. I mean, it, it's just the land of fine fine wine in Italy. So there's, um, but the really the the heart of Piedmont where the next two wines are, are from this area, which is the broader region is called the Lange, right? And Lange in the Piedmontese dialect, it means like tongue, right? So the idea behind like tongue is that really this is, the region is really surrounded by rivers on three sides, which kind of form this, you know, tongue shape thing, right? And um, this specific wine is 100% Dolcetto, Um and yeah, Jeff, I got, I got, I got your order, dude. I'll, I'll do this for you, my guy. Um, I'm also encouraging people to use the website to do it because it makes it just, it's easier for me to keep track of everything, but I can do it physically. It's no problem. Um, where are we going? Okay. The Lange, then we're moving on to the Dolcetto. Everybody take us, everybody taste this Dolcetto. Let's just do let's just do, do the drinking part of the drinking. I'm like foaming at the mouth here. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. Dolcetto and Barbera are really grown, grown um, right beside each other. Barbera is the most widely planted grape in Piedmont, FYI. Um, and uh, I don't know if, if um, how far behind that Dolcetto is. But Dolcetto, oh, man, Dolcetto's way more tannic than Barbera and almost always a fuller-bodied wine. And to me, Dolcetto g gets into this plum prune kind of more explicit like blackberry currant flavor and is is like richer deeper and this is more of an op this is this wine's opaque like when i hold this up and i look at try to see my fingers through it i can't you know it's just it's just a deeper richer darker wine than the than the barbera is but it has lower acid so it it the the fruit tends to be a little bit more prevalent on the wine and doesn't have the same freshness or crisp character to it. Um, it's funny. I get like blackberry currant. I can see the pruny thing to it too. Um, and I get a touch of like what I think of as like fennel. Like it has more of like a like a almost licoricey character to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm 
<clears throat> so this comes from this area is called Doliani, and um, it is the it is the the purple area here to the to the kind of bottom bottom left, um, and the the G is soft. So when we see this see this on the label, it says it looks like Dogliani. It's it's soft G, so it's Doliani. And Doliani is exclusively, when we see Doliani on a wine label, Doliani is a Dolcetto only uh, DOC, DOCG now. Um, it's like, this is, this is a place we, we, can, we can call it Doliani, we can only call it Doliani. If we grow Barbera here or Nebbiolo, it's going to be Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo Lange or like or Lange Nebbiolo or Lange Barbera. We can grow other grape varieties here, but if we do Dolcetto here, it's Doliani. Um, and see, interestingly, because we talk about this being being acidic, but it's like to me, it's not as acidic as the Barbera was. It's it's definitely tannic though. Like the tannin is the tannin and Carly, like. I don't want to split hairs with, with, you know, the folks out there, but for the, um, like, like the Barbera definitely like will make your mouth water. And that acidity is really, really bright. This to me, the texture dries my mouth out more and it has like a tactile sensation. Like, like drinking this gives like, it has more of a velvety character. I definitely think that this needs time to breathe. And when I when I talk about when I talk about the acidity, like this being more tannic than acidic, like when you give it a little bit of time in your mouth, like you'll feel the texture still stays there on your tongue and the roof of your mouth. Where on the back end, it, on the finish, it really goes away because the wine has a lower acidity than the Barbera. But let me know if that makes sense. And I, I hope I'm doing a good way of explaining that. Cause like tannin and acid are, Hey, there is tannic acid too. That's its own thing. But like, like these are, they're, they're, they're similar. The way we experience them are relatively similar phenomenons, you know, and they both give you a drying sensation in, in your mouth. And they're not like, a sweet, you know, they don't come across as like fruity, you know? Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't think, and this is, this is me, this is hard. So, and to talk about residual sugar, like we, we can't, so the, the rule of this, um, this DOCG would, the region won't allow you to have, I mean, the, the your, your residual sugar that you're allowed is really, really minimal. It would be, it's probably legally like five grams per liter or less. So like less than half a percent, even though it's got, it, it does leave some kind of, kind of, it leaves some legs in the, um, in the glass. That's probably more due to the alcohol than the, um, the, um, than the residual sugar. Yep, and Kelly kind of breaks it down here. Acid gives you the pucker character. Tannin, tannin creates a, 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 like an astringency. Tannin is like when we like like when tea has been oversteeped, or especially tea. Like tea is more tannic, where where coffee has tannin and acid. Um, and like if we leave tea in too long, like I'm really getting into oolong tea. By the way, guys, like, oh, my God, right? Wow, oolong. Um, but but sometimes I'll know if I've oversteeped something because all of a sudden it's, like, got a little bit of astringency from the tannin. This thing is probably, like, super boozy, too. Yeah, it's 14% alcohol. You know, they're allowed. This is a thing with imported wines in the United States. We're allowed to be, um, imported wines are allowed to be up to 1.5% uh, in variation with the stated amount of alcohol, this this is this allows them to you know for a variety of reasons it allows them to bottle 
different batches and have, you know, some, some flex with what they're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. mm. And only 13.8. Does everybody have, yeah, the, um, cause this is, I have the 2017 of this Doliani and it's, um, it's 13.5% alcohol. I'm going to move on and just keep going into, cause I talked about, I talked about Dolcetto. Um, see, um, oh, and the name means little sweet one, right? Which is kind of a misnomer because like, like it's really called little sweet one because the grape is small. So then it's very concentrated and has a lot of skin compared to the juice. So it ends up being a darker wine and it's sweet because it ripens relatively early and like dogs and birds and everything likes to eat this stuff once it gets ripe. So, um, yep. Plum, blueberry, almond, licorice. I definitely get the fennel thing on this. It's a little earthy. To me, this is kind of like... Like on the earthy front, it's it's more like tilled soil than it is like mushroom. Like it, like we were talking about the petrichor thing. Like it rained with the Barbera. This is more like 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 it's the springtime, and I like just like 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 moved the dirt dirt around, and I'm seeing like really dark, really dank earth. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Some people are going to have the 2019 of this, and some people are going to have 2017. I do have to mention that. And what I'm going to sell is the 2019. Um, so the vintage changed on on this wine, kind of in the middle of me doing all this, because I think I I think I went live with this class like six weeks ago. Um, oh, Chris, thanks for the thing on the 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 Bohe tea. I I will definitely give that a shot. Um, getting super into tea lately. All right, we talk about this. Def Does everybody see how this has definitely got more body than the Barbera, though? Like, to me, Dolcetto is, like, a pretty great, like, meat and potatoes wine. You know, like, it can, like, you can, like, this this can hang with, like, steaks and, like, you know, all the fatty stuff. This is actually pretty damn good with, like, El Pastor or... Um, Oh man, I, I I should so have really brushed up on like my my Piedmontese um uh um like like in Piedmont they'll do like a Barolo braised beef cut and then they'll serve it with polenta and this is a wine for that a hundred percent you know like to me this is like fatty it's it's for like it's for like relatively rich red meats. You know, and things that are kind of fatty but aren't necessarily like super acid driven foods um, and like hearty, hearty, hearty stuff, too. And grill, grilled things. Um, don't say El Pastor. Just Pastor. What, what am I? What am I supposed to? Why not, man? What happened to 2018? Dude, I don't know what happened to 2018, man. I know we went from 17 to 18 with this Doliani, which is really weird. Oh, now you want some Alpha I know, man, for, for sure, right? Um, yeah, I get like a pruny plum, like blackberry thing. It's funny that I get the fennel and I don't get, I don't, I don't personally get black pepper. It's mildly floral and it's got like a tilled earth thing going on to me. And, you know, we talk about, like, 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 it seems like so, it's hard not to say that Italian red wines aren't going to go with just, just, just pastas. Um, um, oh my gosh. And I'm going to butcher this and somebody out there, out there will know. So like a classic, uh, Engolote, Engolote, um, is like the, it's like you make, it's, uh, it's almost like a, like a, uh, it's almost like a linguine, but it's with like extra egg yolks. So it's like a, a more, it's an egg pasta that's darker. It has a more bright yellow color and we serve it with like a, uh, um, a butter sage or like some kind of braised beef or something. Yeah. 
Um, Piedmontese diet really, Piedmontese foods really are like more butter cream orientated and egg pasta orientated and don't really do the, and cheese and don't really do the tomato thing. But yeah, like spaghetti, like this is a classic, this is, I think Barbera is more of a spaghetti and like red sauce plate because it's got the acidity to match tomatoes. Where I think Dolcetto really works more is like a braised meat, like, like polenta, like, like, you know, fatty kind of fatty guy. My wife thinks the tannins in this seem similar to Malbec. You know what I think it is, Chris, is, is, and this is my weird, like, I think Americans like Malbec a lot because Malbec has a, is, has a lot of tannin and it's low acid too. So like, 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 yeah, I think that's kind of fair, you know? And I think more like, once again, back to the deductive thing, Malbec's beauty is like when it's grown in a relatively warm place, it, it has a like really pretty sexy fruit and not a lot of acid. So you're like, this is a big fat wine and it's, it's tannic. It's a big fat wine, but it's not really hard on the back. It just really goes down, you know? And like, yeah, this offers a little bit more resistance, kind of because Piedmont's, Piedmont's kind of a cool climate, whereas, like, most of us, our experience with Malbec is, like, like from Argentina, and it's got, like, but they, they've got a similar, they got a similar thing going on. It's a cool, it's a cool analogy. Hmm. Yes, Agnolote. Yep, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. Thank you. And you know what I mean. It's the it's the egg pasta that's that's super eggy. Um, Dolcetto would be great with like a sage butter sauce. Um, oh no no no! Egg, oh, agnolote is the little like we. It's it's almost like a. Um, it's it's like a it's um it's like a ravioli, but it's a different shape. And it's got like braised beef inside of it, and you don't serve it with tomatoes. Yep, um, tajanine is the is the is the super eggy pasta. That's what I'm thinking. I'm getting them confused. Um, yeah. All right, we did this. We talked about ah the anaudi. Here's what's super cool about this wine too, and I didn't even get to this. So um, this is. The Podere uh, Luigi Enaude. Um, Enaude was the second president of the Republic of Italy, which is just wild. And he founded this vineyard in Doliani as like a young adult. And um, so, I mean, he was like, and he was an economist by trade. You know, um, and he post the, you know, end of the monarchy in Italy. Um, he was the second president. So this is the, the, the vineyard still keeps his name. He, yeah, you know, it's wild stuff, man. You know, um, and he was really, he was really instrumental in, in, in insisting that they like, he, they had a bottle, they had a bottling facility and a cave there. They weren't, he wasn't just a wine grower. He was going to make and sell wine at the same time. They also produce a variety of Barolos, um, but the vineyard itself was founded in, in this area of Piedmont. And they make just around, just over 12,000 cases of this wine in any given year. This, the 2015 vintage of this was one of Wine Spectator's top 100 wines of the year. Um, once again, there's no oak there's no oak on this. Um, I think it can hang around for a little while, too. Dolcetto, Dolcettos can will really soften a bit. I, I get more of a spicy thing as I, as I drink this. Mmm. Mm-hmm. 
Somebody help me out with that. Is, is somebody knows out there? It's Tajarneen is the super eggy pasta, and it's really like a deep, deep yellow, and that's more the linguine guy. Yeah, um, and the Egnolote is a is like a little is more like a ravioli dude with like with like usually pork inside of it. Um, but both are super. I mean, you gotta like slather them with butter. Um, questions about the about dolcetto? Even though it means a little sweet one. It's, it's still done in a dry style. This Doliani, D-O-C-G, is really, it, 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 this is really the preeminent place to make, um, to make Dolcetto. Um, it's really pretty tannic stuff um, without being super high in acid. There's no oak on this. So all that, like, like that dry stuff is just the grape, which is kind of wild to me. Yeah, and there is, like, the, to me, there's, like, the pruny like blackberry currant thing going on with it. I like this. The more and more I have this, the more I, uh, the more I drink it, the more I'm like, there's, I see more going on and it needs a little bit of air. Mm. I don't want to drift on this too much, but I've been making this like, this polenta casserole with Swiss chard. And then like, it, it's like, it's like, I, I use just like, like a stick of butter and like a cup and a half of, of polenta. And like, that's why polenta tastes good sometimes, man. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I cook, I, I try to, um, I don't know. I, I, I fool around with mushrooms depending on whether, but it's like a pound and a half of mushrooms and you, you know, you dry, you cook them in their own juice, which is always really cool, man. And you kind of just kind of reduce those guys. And then Swiss chard, which is like, which I usually think is just kind of like hard and astringent. Once I get that going and like about 28 ounces of diced tomatoes and some Fontina, I'm probably going to mess around with some other cheeses, man. It's, it's, it's pretty good stuff. And it goes great with Piedmontese wines. It's like, and it's like, I, it's like a, it's like a cheater's lasagna because it's easier, you know? And like, I'll have that for days and I love it with Piedmontese. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Tajarin. I knew you'd help, man. Kelly Wall, thank you, man. You just be, you be, you be Googling for me, dog. You, you're out there helping me. Oh, thank you, man. Um, yeah. Mm. Tajarin. Any questions about the Dolcetto while, while we do this? I'm going to move, I'm going to move on pretty soon here. Dolcetto's really grown all throughout Piedmont. I'll give it just a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Dolcetto is Dol Dolcetto is grown in the U.S. Um, interestingly, that that's I mean I don't know how passionately you guys follow Ray's Dolcetto's grown in in Santa Barbara County. Um, Wow, man, I'm sure there's places in, like, Mendocino that, that do it, too, for sure. Um, definitely in California. Um, da -da -da -da. That's a lot of egg yolks. Sounds amazing, though. Yeah, it, it's a really cool pasta, and it's, like, deep. It's, like, a deep. It becomes really yellow. You, you, yeah, I don't know if you need a, a Nate recipe book. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's, I got, I got like seven or eight things I just cook all the time and I'm, yeah. Um, yeah. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta come in here and talk to me in person. I could talk about some food, man, or I'll, I'll get, I'll get totally sidetracked. Oh, it's, it's the Piedmontese dialect for Tagliatelle. That makes total sense, Kelly. Thank you. Um, no questions about Dolcetto. I'm going to move on. Mm. Mm. 
Jeff, it's okay, man. We can... Yeah. Barbera de Asti and Dolcetto are... Barbera and Dolcetto are pretty different from each other. It's kind of wild, right? Okay. So we're going to talk about, about Nebbiolo now. And Nebbiolo means like... Um, like, it means like the little foggy one. Like, little foggy one, right? Because the... The idea here was that it really did well in like the fog grew well in the fog covered hills of the Lange. Okay. Um, now let's look at this, the color of this, right? Because um, check this out. It's totally this is almost this is almost like a translucency through it. You can see through this, right? And during the on the edge, we definitely get like an orange color to it but um so so nebbiolo has really it's low in what we call anthocyanins it doesn't have a lot of like extraction or color to it this is kind of um accentuated by this one specifically a large part of this comes from the area called the roero kind of in the northern part of the Longue, which has more sandy soils for whatever reason, and 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 I'm not you know a grape scientist, but when we grow a, a lot of different grape varieties, when we grow them in sandy soils, they have less. Uh, they produce less pigment in their skin in the grape skins, and they tend to produce lighter colored wines. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're not as full bodied. This is one of those don't judge a book by its color too because man when we try this wine whoa it is thick it's heavy it's tannic it's really really rich despite its light color wow wow okay so um yeah and Nebbiolo is 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 really late ripening, right? Um, and it's uh, and it tends to have relatively high alcohol, high acid, and tannins. So it's kind of like you know, in Spinal Tap, it goes to eleven. You know, there's lot. It's it's both intense and complex at the same time. So this is a this is interesting for Nebbiolo. So so this is really one of the the absolute like if we make a list of the fine wine grapes of Italy. The fine red wine grapes of Italy, Nebbiolo is on every single person's list, critic, winemaker, so on and so forth. It's in the top three. Everybody's. Nobody is doubting it. it. This is one of the most important indigenous grape varieties to Italy, right? Barolo and Barbaresco are, are wines that are made exclusively from Nebbiolo and can demand hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of dollars per bottle for, for some of the very most collectible and aged things. And this is what they're made from. Um, this is in, this is unique in the sense that this is a younger version of Nebbiolo um, that is uh, unoaked. Typically, when we see Nebbiolo from Barolo or Barbaresco, which are very, very famous wine regions, um, their uh, Barolo is aged a minimum of three years, where a Barbaresco will be two in like three years in wood for Barolo, two years in wood for uh, Barbaresco minimally. Um, all right. Oh wow. Nebbiolo reminds me of Pinot Noir in color and flavor. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think in color, Nebbiolo is really reminiscent of, of Pinot Noir. I would say when I, you know, in a blind tasting, you know, the thing that would give it away when I would, because I would look at this wine and I would think like, okay, immediately I'm like, this has this orange color and it's definitely from a cooler climate because it's the orange color and not this super warmer climate reds have lower acidity and are, and are just darker in color. So I'd say that, and from deduction, I know this is a cooler, from a cooler climate. Um, and the orange color would probably make me think it's kind of an older wine because as red wines age, they, they get lighter in color and take on more of an orange hue. But when I look at the wine, the thing that kind of gives it away to me that there isn't, it isn't old and it's just, this is more akin to the grape variety, 
is there's not a separation between the tannin and when we look at the color of it and hold it up, it's really like, like as wines age, as red wines age, there becomes like kind of a meniscus and the, the tannins start to separate from the alcohol and there'll be like a rim that's almost clear in color and a gradation of, of, um, you know, orange to a darker color. This doesn't have the gradation. So this tells me that the wine is young and, but yet it has this, this orange hue. So the wines to me that would have throw that orange hue and are relatively young when they're, while they're relatively young, um, are Sangiovese, uh, Alianico, Nebbiolo, and possibly cooler climate Pinot Noir. There's a couple other weird ones out there, but you know, those, I kind of get it down to that. So it's like, you know, there's, there's about three, but this is like, like most Sangiovese, you know, which is the wine of the grape of Chianti and stuff is going to be darker than this. So Nebbiolo is actually usually pretty easy to, I, for me, like to narrow it down to this Nebbiolo is pretty easy in a blind tasting. Hopefully, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this wine has depth, you know, I mean, it, it really does. Um, it's, it's tangy. Um, you know, I'm leaving these kind of descriptors up here. There's lots of tannin to this. There's about, there's about 15 individual regions in, in, uh, Piedmont that exclusively specialize in Nebbiolo. Um, this is, when we look at this Angelo Negro wine, this is really, this is what's called, it's just the Longue Nebbiolo. Um, and uh, it's sourced from two areas in the Longue. When we look, it's up here, the Roero. And then some of it actually comes from, from a, uh, around Nieve in Barbaresco. So it's, it's these two areas here. So they get to come they get to call it by the broader region, if, if that makes sense, you know, like if you're, you know, like if your wife was from Kenosha and you were from Sheboygan, you just say, we're Wisconsinites, you know, where if you guys were both from, you know, like, like, uh, Kenosha, you'd say we're Kenoshans, you know, like, yeah, uh, hopefully it's a good analogy. Um, bring the classes back. Dude, it, it, it'll happen, man. It's just, it's, it's going to be great when it does. Um, oh, man. Oh, Dennis is asking me about the Piedmont guy. Yeah, this is imported by this guy from Minnesota. He's like, he's, I think he's even younger than me, man. And his name's, the dude's name's, West. check this out, man. My guy's name is Weston. Horde, right? I'm not making this up. That's his name, right? And he, like, lived in Piedmont for, I don't know, like, like 10 years? And he's from Minnesota, and he exclusively imports wines from Piedmont now. And he worked at a winery called Paolo Scavino in Barolo, um, and now he just works with, like, like 9 or 10 Piedmontese producers, including this, Angelo Negro, which... They're in the Roero and um, make some really, really fun wines, you know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, first live class, we taste 10 wines. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and by, by just choice, this guy decided to only do Piedmontese wines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, These are incredibly long-lived wines, like incredibly, incredibly long-lived. Like, like even this basic Nebbiolo, like 10, 10 years, no problem. Just forget about it. In fact, this, these are the things I collect mostly because, I, you know, it's like you can be a kind of a lazy wine collector with, with, with Nebbiolo-based wines and, and just kind of forget about them. And they're going to they're gonna be great. You know, and they'll almost always get like softer, but they still maintain these really deep savory flavors and they, they, they're, they really stay complex 
they lose a little bit of their fruit, but they're usually not very fruit-driven wines to begin with. Um, tasting bus, right? Um, okay, we did this. Yeah, let's let's talk about this. So we, I kind of, I kind of got into this a little bit, you know. Nebbiolo is something that's really just it's its own indigenous thing to Piedmont. Um, it's really not grown successfully anywhere else. People play around with it in California. Interestingly, um, there's some of it grown in um, uh, Baja California in Mexico. I haven't had any, and I'm really excited to try try those. I'd be really interested to try them. Yeah, I, and I talk about this a lot. Like, like Nebbiolo is really, this is a great one. If you guys have an aerator or a decanter at home, this is, this is prime, prime candidate for decanting. A lot of times in the spring... Um, I used to really go out of my way to make risotto, like and 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 get like morel, morels. Um, and when I would, I'd make like a morel risotto, and um, and I would I would usually bust out I'd, the first thing I would do. I'd get up really early in the morning, and I would decant like not really early. I'd get up at like seven. 6.30, which is when I normally get up. But I would decant whatever we were having, which was usually a Barolo or a Barbaresco, and I would leave it open in a decanter for 12 plus hours while I went about my day. And occasionally I'd walk by and swirl it around. Because Nebbiolo wines, even when they're like 10, 15 years old, man, they, they just, they're really reductive. You can throw a ton of air at them and they really will change. That's kind of the beauty of, beauty of Nebbiolo. It's like like, as you guys are drinking this, you'll probably notice it's, like, it does tend to soften up. Um, I get all kinds of wild flavors out of these. Like, really, like, tar a lot of times. Tar, people say roses. I almost always get tar and roses out of Nebbiolo. And it has a real dried, like, dried temperate climate flower thing. Kind of a pope, kind of a potpourri jam. You know, and I love the clay pot that they said clay pot because I do get the, the earthy, like damp kind of a cave smell, but not like in a bad way, in a really, in a really, really, in a really intriguing way. Um, and, and the wines can smell like mushrooms themselves, too. And it's almost like a red fruit, like a like a, you know, a tart cherry like more tart cherry rhubarb pomegranate is another flavor I get in Nebbiolo a lot. And in this one, I, especially I'm getting a pomegranate vibe. Um, yeah, this will age. Like, like I said, I mean like no problem in a weird way to hold this for like five, five plus years. This is an unoaked, like younger style of Nebbiolo too, that they're intentionally putting out to, to, to drink relatively early. But I am telling you guys like these with like super, super funky cheeses, washed rind cheeses. Um, I wouldn't do it with a blue, but anything that's like a stinky runny, like funk, funk bomb, totally. Um, risotto, ri risotto, 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 risotto game. Like, if you're an elk or deer person, oh, my God. Forget about it. This stuff is so great. And especially, like, wine-braised meats. This is just – Nebbiolo really, really, really likes those things. And it, it, it really pairs well with, like, root vegetables and, like, like I, I'm, I know I'm beating the polenta thing to death. But, like, polenta, risotto, root vegetables, braised meats, game, super funky cheeses. Obviously, truffles – I haven't even talked about this. White truffles, Piedmont is Piedmont is like the home of white truffles, and Elba in Piedmont is where all, you know, all it all comes from. Kelly Wall is saying any pasta with mushrooms, any pasta with mushrooms. Once again, I keep making this like polenta dish with like I'll get like a pound and a half of porcini's and just go to town on that, or I'll get like a mix of like porcini's and portobellas and like just 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 go to town on it with like 
Swiss chard and Fontina or a Tome, like pretty, sometimes relatively funky cheeses to, to it too. Um, yeah, it's one of the wines I really like with like Pleasant Ridge Reserve, which is a, you know, really great uh, Wisconsin cheese um, too. Um, yeah, Chris is saying you could a thousand percent go with this and some red deer elk or something like that. Yeah, I, I very much appreciate Nebbiolo um, with, with, with gamey foods. And I tend, I tend to find like, like, like because the wine itself is so savory and has such non-fruit elements to it that when we do pair it with game, with gamey foods, you actually tend to start to taste some of the fruit of the wine. Um, Risotto. Risotto and no clothes, sure, why not? I mean, this, it could be like, you know, there's definitely, you know, a bacchanalia to that. And I'm sure like, you know, Roman emperors would approve. Where in the world do you find one and a half pounds of porcini? Oh, wow. Great, great question. Um, oh, man. I, I think this has happened at Outpost on 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 more than one time. <laughs> yeah, it definitely. Um, this is worth spending the money on mushrooms too, for sure. Really, I, I'm really serious with that with Nebbiolo wines. And Nebbiolo based wines can be really get really expensive though, too, guys. I'm showing you like like and I mean I don't mean this in a pejorative um a, a, a pejorative way, like um this is not um um I don't mean this in a pejorative way. This is like bargain basement nebbiolo. This is what I'm showing you is really inexpensive nebbiolo. I mean, these wines, Barolo and Barbaresco wines can get to be, you know, hundreds of dollars a bottle. And, like, usually the starting point for them is around $30 a bottle. We did the Lange. Talked a little about, about Angelo Negro. Um, they're an organic producer. They... <laughs> They've been making wine since the 1670s in the Roero, and the actual eponymous Angelo uh, is, is the family's make. It, he's this guy, you know, second to the right over here. Um, <laughs> and this picture, I think, is from the 40s, and it's the family, you know. Um, yep, and they make a white wine called Arnais. Um, yeah, man, Mushroom Mike, Mushroom Mike is somebody I've gotten a ton, yeah, a, a ton of mushrooms from, too. Um, okay, here is the, um, yeah, and Mushroom Mike used to sell direct to, to Outpost, and I don't know if he does, I don't know if he does anymore, or if he's just... He's just seasonally, but I, he cultivates everything like indoors year round. So, um, mm. Mm. yeah, I know River Valley Ranch too. And, uh, my mother-in-law lives in McGuanago and then we used to always go to, um, uh, rushing waters in Palmyra to get tr smoked trout and yep and river valley ranch too um okay guys and here's kind of the skinny on this it's all nebbiolo um it's in sandy and calcareous clay uh, calcareous soil sorry and the sandy soils tend to make nebbiolo even lighter in color um this is aged 12 months before it's blended and bottled but it's once again not an oak, and the twelve-month period really more softens the wine than anything else. Um, they're saying you can age this for you know easily five years. I think this is my last slide. Oh yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah. 
Nebbiolo is also really thought of as kind of like, like the, um, it, it occupies less than, than something like less than 15% of all the vineyard space in Piedmont, but it's really the, it, it really is thought of the fine red wine there for sure. Thoughts or questions about um, about um, about Nebbiolo about the Angelo Negro Nebbiolo. Man, years ago, yeah, Mushroom Mike does deliver too. That's a really good point. Years ago, I did a, I did, I did like a, a tasting with him for, like, or I did an event with him. Maybe it was for the Slow Food Group. It was at the Urban Ecology Center, and we both talked about, we talked about, you know, he talked about mushrooms, and I talked about just wine, of course. Oh, and Rebecca, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're asking, her, do they oak these wines? Hell yeah. I mean, Nebbiolo gets the shit out, oaked out of it. I mean, like, people will oak Nebbiolo for, like, five years. I mean, they'll put it in, like, like literally, like, like Nebbiolo is just, yeah, 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 yeah. So Barolo and Barbaresco-based wines, wines in the area of Barolo and Barbaresco where, we, where Nebbiolo has really become famous. Like, in Barolo, you minimally have to age your Nebbiolo in oak for three three years before you release it in barbaresco you have to do it for two yeah which further makes these wine the nebbiolo richer and crazier Bar Bar barbara is becoming more and more of an oak thing dolcetto it, people oak dolcetto they do all of them um 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 uh where am i getting at with this yeah all of these are oak i kind of showed you unoaked versions because you a it keeps the price of this class down because as soon as we move into barola or barresco the wines very rapidly become like 40 50 bucks a bottle minimum um and then you know it's it's less expensive to make wines without wooden without tiny little wooden barrels that cost a thousand bucks a pop um Man, fuck you, Kelly. <laughs> so dumb. I, I mean, like, you can't hear somebody else swear. <laughs> Thoughts on the Nebbiolo? I mean, you, you will notice, like, this is... Nebbiolo also, I mean, I can talk and talk about this forever, but... But Nebbiolo is also the type of wine where, like... Like, when I would when i had to go to a bunch of restaurants to sell wine and like as just a salesperson that that sold wine wholesale i i had a coravin the last couple of years i was doing this but i would like never coravin or aerate you know or do the vacuum or anything on a nebbiolo and i would show it for three or four days and it would get better and better and better and better you know what i mean yeah um so you know, like, like ne you, you, anybody who's drinking the Nebbiolo, like, I suggest, I mean, hey, do whatever you want. But if you have, like, even a modicum of restraint, just try this the next day. I mean, it's going to be really a lot softer. And you're going to get, a, the, the fruit tends to come out is what happens. And the tannins usually soften up a little bit. So, remember, guys, like, if you want to get any of the wines, these are, like, Whenever when I think about this, I'm like, man, these are kind of cheapies in a really good way. And they're they're really like these are the food wines. I mean, this is the stuff like when people are like, what do you drink? I mean, this is the stuff I drink in, in all honesty, because I have them with just basic food at home. I have it with the food food I love, you know, and Italian cuisine is like I just love the rustic, basic nature of Italian food and how how the food and wine works in this lockstep way. Like, like no other cuisine and wine in the world. Um, and I really did kind of, 
I mean, I'll, I'll pat myself on the back. I really thought about this from a perspective of like, let's get wines that people can have on their table every day, you know? Um, yeah, and the Barbera, I'm with everybody. I mean, the Barbera is just a stunner to me. And I, I, I drink that wine. I'm like, I'm like, it's, it's almost embarrassing how much I've, I've, how much of that wine I've had. Um, do you have a lot of these in stock? Well, um, guys, just do this through the whole website thing. Cause I'll, and then I'll put them aside for you. I don't have a lot of them in stock because what kind of happens is I have everybody watch this and then it's an incredibly weird moving target how they get ordered. So, um, like I said, I'll have everything here by Wednesday. You know, I have a, I have a couple cases of each on hand, but but due to the moving, you know, the nature of it, I usually try not to have these things available until next Wednesday because then I can guarantee I can get everything here for everybody. Jeff, I'm so glad you love old world wines. I really do too. Yeah, man, I know. The, the Barbera is really like, it's, it's just a great food wine. It, it, it's, I can't even, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, and a lot of times Nebbiolo becomes like, I kind of think of Nebbiolo as like the Italian version of Pinot Noir because it's really super flexible food. The interesting thing, though, when we if we really were going to sit down and have like a Nebbiolo side by side with a Pinot Noir, you would just be like, fuck, this Nebbiolo is tannic, my guy. It's so much more tannic than Pinot Noir. Even though the color looks like it, uh-uh. We're like, we're, it's totally different. Schedule a Barolo tasting after we get our tax refunds. Damn, Dean. I wish I was getting some money back from those taxes because I'm not. But yeah, man, we should. Do, dude, I, I should just do a Nebbiolo class like once we go live. I Because it, it's a mind blower because there's this whole I didn't even get into this. There's this whole Alto Piemonte area where there's like. Gatanara and Geme and Valtellina. There's all these other regions to it too, and they're they and they do a little bit of blending of different grape varieties, um, Vespolina and things like this. There's there's all kinds of really rare small production red grape varieties in Piedmont too that are fascinating and unique, and some of them are only grown in like a dozen small villages, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of these things, like a Bordeaux class, I, I, I've got to have like, like, I got, I got to be able to pour a bunch of wines to do that. Um. Yep. Yeah, please. Funny. Yes. Yes. All right, guys. I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna give it like five more minutes. And if you have any questions, let me know. Again, if you want to order any of the wines, do it through the website. It'll, like, they won't let you put a date in. But I'll call, I'll contact you and just, you know, let you know when your order is processed and then you can pick it up anytime after that. It'll be anytime after um, Wednesday. Man, yeah, this thing's really opening up. Sometimes a crazy thing sometimes I get out of, out of Nebbiolo is I get almost like a ginger note on it. Yeah, I think if we did the whole like, like Barolo versus Barbaresco thing, like we'd we'd wanna, um, yeah, man, I think we could even go deeper than that. It's actually kind of cool. Like when um, the last class we did before before you know the the like you know <laughs> just before like like something like March. I think it was March fifteenth. It was even earlier that like the first week of March in 2020, I had the folk, I had the um, folks from the Mokagata winery in uh, Barbaresco and the Pira winery in Barolo. And we did a Barolo Barbaresco live class. Now we're getting all the, like the suggestions. I love these. Yeah, I know, Stephanie. I mean, I love the Italian wines. We could just do this for a year, and it could just be Italian wines. Yeah, man, the ginger is really weird on this, isn't it? Like, I get that on Nebbiolo a lot. 
the disease. <laughs> Jeff Kaki, you are a funny guy, man. I gotta tell you that. <laughs> Man, even like Nebbiolo works pretty well with like kind of just basic Parmesan y kind of cheeses, too. <laughs> Man, I can't wait till I can do like the like open house style tastings too yeah because I, I hear you stephanie like like the kind of king queen of reds yeah we we toyed her scott and i had toyed around with this as an idea too um oh yeah oh terrence okay yeah i can see that like like it's interesting man like like Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo, there, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of similarities. Like Nebbiolo is very sight driven, meaning like it really expresses itself in different ways where, depending on where it's grown and, and, you know, Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir both, both are like that a lot. Yeah. I know, man, I can't wait to do an open house one. Like, especially like something that's like, um, I'd, I'd love to do it. Oh, I think at one point we did do one that was all Italian. Or maybe I had it planned and I had to cancel it. Yeah, screw COVID for sure, man. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Fuck COVID. Oh, hey, can you put food pairing recommendations on the website prior to the class so we can prepare? Dude, that is a really good idea. Holy shit, Ted. Yeah, um, Bob, I, I know what you're talking about with the Frisia. Yeah, Frisia, Ruke, Vespolina, like, yeah. I mean, there's tons of, we Grignolino is another really weird little red there. Um, oh, did I show you a Lange Pinot? Huh. There's a Lange Riesling. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for all the thanks for all the questions and comments. Um, once again, you know, shameless plug. If you want to buy the wines, I'll have them ready for you on Wednesday. Um, take care. Have a great a great weekend. I'll put some more classes up. Uh, by the end of next week too for for um for May <laughs>